Hello and warm welcome to the 100th year anniversary of the World Robot. My name is Alena Ising and I work at the UCLA Research Library at the International Studies Department as the librarian for Slavic, East European, Central Asia and Eurasian studies. I am delighted to welcome you to our webinar, which will focus on a Czech writer, Karel Čapek, and his groundbreaking science fiction play entitled RUR, Rosum Universal Robots. We will explore the influence of this literary work on many art forms, and we will also get information on present state of robotics. This event is organized by the Consulate of the Czech Republic in Los Angeles and the UCLA Library with a sponsorship of the UCLA Department of the Slavic, East European and Eurasian Studies, Languages and Cultures. I would like to also welcome our uh, speakers. We have very great distinguished uh, creative people who will share with you their experiences either with literature, art, performing arts and science. I would like also like to mention that uh, Karel Čapek had a brother. Uh, his name was Josef Čapek, who, uh, who was both artist and writer. The brothers Čapek sometimes created together and they wrote together. The word robot was used in Karel Čapek's place for the first time, but it was Karel's brother, Josef Čapek, who was the first, who came up with the word. He was the true inventor. The word in itself actually means forced labor or worker in Czech from robota, or in, in Russian robota, in Czech robota. The brothers Čapek are commemorated both for their literary and artistic works and political activism against oppressive government and the Nazi occupation. Their house is now a cultural monument of the Czech Republic and there are various memorials to them. The word robot sparked new literary art and performance works and nowadays we see robot in the science of robotics, which started a long standing debate on the social, moral and economic arguments. I would like to also take the liberty to invite you to check our additional creative work that actually complements this event. If you look at the chat, you will see an online exhibit entitled Robot is 100. And this exhibit was created by Julia Tannenbaum, library student assistant with a partnership uh, with consulate of the Czech Republic in Los Angeles with their input and material, materials from consular affairs officer Aneta Campbell and consul general Jaroslav Olsha. Another project is selected international reading list that was created by my colleague Giselle Rios, who is the outreach coordinator at the International Department of the Charles Young Research Library. Librarians from the international studies actually selected few uh, books and publications that are at the UCLA library and you can access them through the catalog. We also have a BBC audio who, uh, which actually features one of the departments of the Slavic and East European and Eurasian studies um, graduate, um, Jesse Brown Odell, who has a piece in this audio. So everybody can copy these links and maybe later look into these wonderful resources for future research. 
Uh, before I start my introduction, I would like to express my gratitude to all my colleagues at the library, and you can see their names. First of all, it's the International and Area Studies Department um, and my supervisor, Jennifer Osorio, for giving me the time to work on this um, work and for her support. Jade Alburo, Ruby Belgam, Diane Mizrachi, Shannon Tanhai Ahari, Alice Hunt, Tula Orum, and Nick Te Fuller. I also would like to thank our two students who were very helpful, especially Julia and Cyan. Also some of my colleagues from the research library, Susie Lee, Ben Alkali, Diana King, and Christopher Lopez. Also UCLA Powell Library, Simon Lee, H Hannah Sutherland, Ashley Peterson. And um, the Consulate General of the Czech Republic on, in Los Angeles, Mr. Jaroslav Olsha Jr. and Aneta Campbell. And the last but not least, the UCLA Department of Slavic, East European and Eurasian Languages and Cultures, Professor and Chair Ronald Vrun, Professor Susan Kresin, Sasha Razor, and Jess Brown Odell. We have wonderful speakers. As I said, um, we have um, several topics and we will deal with uh, all kinds of um, research, may it be in literature, art, performing arts and science. Uh, to get the seminar started, I would like to introduce someone who has a quite long list of accomplishments Please join me in welcoming Jaroslav Olsha, who is the new Consul General of the Consulate General of the Czech Republic in Los Angeles. Before arriving to Los Angeles, Mr. Olsha has been ambassador to Zimbabwe from 2000 to 2006, South Korea from 2008 to 2014, and the Philippines from 2014 to 2018. He published several books on history, art and literature of Asia and Africa. He also has been science fiction editor, translator and bibliographer. Mr. Olsha started a major Czechoslovak fanzine Ikarie XB, which turned into the first Czechoslovak and Czech sci-fi monthly magazine Ikarie published in 1992-2010, and now published as XB1. His most important role in science fiction studies has been a co-editor of the Czech Encyclopedia of Science Fiction Literature. He has edited about a dozen of anthologies, among them the first anthology of Czech science in English, published in India, South Korea, and Japan. Last year, he was one of the contributors and editors of a book entitled Robot 100. Please let me welcome Mr. Olsha to Los Angeles, and I hope we will continue our cooperation. Uh, thank you very much, Alina. Thank you very much, all who are participating today. Uh, as a new Consul General of the Czech Republic, this is the very first event of our Consul since I arrived in December this year. And uh, I am really happy we could cooperate with this, with the Department of the Slavic, um, East European and uh, Euro-Asian Studies. I start my introduction to the first guest by, uh, first guest by a short speech. Approximately a decade ago, uh, there was a big discussion in the Czech Republic and the poll, who is the most famous Czech? And uh, as the Czechs are not very nationalistic people, they selected the fictitious personality whose name was Jara Zimmerman, fictitious man who was created in the second half of the 20th century and became the scientist, writer, 
he did everything the best and he became the most famous Czech. Unfortunately, I would say the most famous Czech is definitely the robot. How it is possible the robot became such famous? It's incredible that there is a no single language in the world where robot is, has a name different than robot. We have robotto in Japanese, we have rubut in Arabic. Although there was a moment when the Arab, Arabs, uh, Arab writers wanted to use the term al-insan al-ali, artificial man, but it didn't work well and rubut won over. And I'm really happy that even Klingons are using the word robot. This is a big success when robot really became a complete space personality over the whole universe. That's very great. But it's not the only such a linguistic invention from the Czechs, and I will mention this. When you use the pistol, you should know that pistol is derived through German and French from a Czech word pištěla, which means a flute, because the whistle used by the first guns in the medieval ages looked like a flute. And pištěla came into German, from German into French, and now we have pistol, which is all over the world. And even using a dollar has a connotation, linguistic connotation to Czechs because 401 years ago uh, in a small Czech city of Yachimov, which was rich in silver, they started producing their coin named Tolar. And Tolar became a dollar in Spain. And from Spain with their silver coin, it went up to the United States. But coming back to robot, for me, Robot is the most famous Czech. And I'm happy that I can introduce the first speaker which we have today, whose name is Jaroslav Weiss. Uh, Jaroslav Weiss is uh, the, uh, one of the start of one of the begin beginning, uh, the first person who started Czech, modern Czech science fiction already in the 1970s. His two short story collections published in the second half of the 1970s were something untypical for the Czechoslovak then communist culture. He wrote very short, very good science fiction stories, which changed the image of science fiction. Why he did it? Because he was also a well-known translator. He was a translator of a Brian W. Aldi's Hot House into Czech, but he translated many more science fiction works in the 1970s and 80s. He's also a very important Czech journalist, worked as an editor-in-chief of one of the three main Czech dailies, Lidové Noviny. And in last years, he's not so much active in science fiction field, but more as a political commentator and also as a translator. And when I mention the titles he translated recently, you will see. One of them is The World is Flat by by Thomas L. Friedman, and he also translated the defend, In Defense of a Liberal Education by Farid Zakaria. He is a popularizer, popularizer of science. He wrote many books on this topic, and he was also active in promoting science among the youths and adults. Most logical, he was the person who wrote, as I say, official description of the history of 100 years of Czech robot. If I can, please. I will pass the space to Mr. Weiss. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you for, can you hear me? Is it okay? Well, uh, first, thanks for the, uh, thanks Yaroslav for the invitation. Uh, or, and I must first announce that I'm not a wonderful speaker. I'm just speaker and uh, more, Man of the written word and the spoken word. So I prepared my uh, my participation as a kind of an article, and I start to read it anyway. Prague is a magical city. It also had its magical times. One of them was the early twenties of the last century. At that time, Prague gave the word three literary characters that marked not only that century. The first was good soldier Schweig. The second was Petty Clark named jo Joseph K or K and the robot. They are very different, but they reflected 
very same reality. The good soldier Schweig, a satirical reaction to the First World War, was created by Jaroslav Hasek and published between 1921 and 23. And according to many, the book is one of the best no war novels ever written, both funny and tragic, and often compared to Joseph Heller's Catch-22. The particular Joseph K. or K. was created by Franz Kafka as a hero and victim of the novel, The Process. And according to many more, this book and this character is significantly influencing the literature and philosophy since its first publication in 1925. The robot was created by Karel Čapek in 1920, and he was not certainly the main character of the theatrical play RUR, short for Rossum's Universal Robots. And yet the robot, with only slight exaggeration, is the most famous and influential Czech ever. On the one hand, as a global literary celebrity, on the other hand, as a phenomenon that increasingly exceeds its role as just a cultural icon and is reflected in practical life. At the same time, story of Chapek's most famous play is full of paradoxes from the very beginning to the present day. For example, the play is known everywhere and by everybody, but it is very difficult to meet someone who has seen it. Only sporadically it's performed by student, experimental or amateur theaters. And if you want to know what is it about, you have to borrow it, borrow the script in the library. This is okay in Tokyo or in Dallas, but it is, this is surprising in a country which considers the play as the most famous of all Czech dramatical works and which considers the author as its great writer of the 20th century. But it is so, no one wants to stage RUR, his most famous play. It is very difficult to sell it to the public, I heard from directors, even from those who are known for being very creative. The National Theatre in Prague refused even to think about staging it now at its 100th anniversary of the birth of Robot. There are only some experiments, a puppet version broadcasted online in coronavirus time, and, and, and an inspired attempt written partly by an artificial, artificial intelligence, which is to have its premiere again online at the end of this month. It is also paradoxical, paradoxical that the play, which became the first television production of the BBC, has never been made into a film. I don't mean a large Hollywood production, but even in the author's home country, where several dozen films or television productions based on the motifs of Chapek less famous works are shot or were shot, no one ever tried to film the most celebrated Czech play. Maybe the reason is simple. Robot, the most famous item of play is just title, but not the main character of RUR. Human characters in the play are not deep enough to survive, the, survive their time for sure. And when it comes to robots, they are even supposed not to have any death of their souls. That's both their existential problem and the key to their success. By the way, even Chapek did not describe them much in the introduction to the play, just what they wore on. Robots, quote, robots are dressed as humans. They are straightforward in movements and pronunciation. They have expressionless face they are just starring. Their blouses are at, the, at waist tightened with a belt and they have brass number on their chests. We learn just a little more about them in play, play itself. This is how Harry Domin, director of the Rosen's Universal Fact, uh, Robots Factory, describes their thinking to Miss Helena Glory. You can let them read the Bible, logarithms, or whatever you like, he says very vaguely. Uh, or you can feed them pineapple, straw, whatever you want, says just as vaguely a few replicas later, Dr. Hallemeister, head of the Institute of Psychology and Robot Education in the play. We don't even know if they have to sleep. After all, the purpose of their existence is only to work 
as efficiently as possible and without pay and everything else which can be summarized under the term soul is eliminated. However, it is difficult to distinguish, distinguish them from real people. So Ms. Glory confuses them with the company CEOs just in the beginning of the play. In any case, what happened? What happened that the play itself has fallen into oblivion, but its supporting character robot becomes more and more important with any next year? Maybe the answer is simple. Chapek in RUR cleverly explored an important topic of his time, the potential destructive influence of technological civilization on society. By the way, this is a motif recurring in many of his other works, and at the same time created an impressive warn warning metaphor of modernity, controlled not so much by ideas and values as by a self-confident and practical intellect and predatory tycoons. There have been many interpretations of this metaphor, starting with the opinion that it was a harsh critic of selfish capitalism to the assumption that the author warns us against the exact opposite, the threat of revolts of revolutions. And probably this message does not impress anybody now. We have a hands full of other types of revolutions than social. Anyway, the place was not uh, the play was not uh, was most probably derived from the short story, the system, reflecting a bit ironically the predatory capitalism. It was co-written co by Chapek's older brother Josef, cubist painter, an excellent thinker. A somewhat crazy story tells about an entrepreneur who wanted to make production so efficient that he hired only workers unable to think, unable to think creatively and without any emotion. Today, we would say those who resemble robots, but in 1918, when the story was published, no one knew the word yet. One of the workers eventually happens to wake up emotionally and the others become infected with emotions and thinking. They start to form social clubs and read the books, and finally they revolt and start killing managers. In any case, the very basic plot is the same as RUR. But in 1920, when Karel Chapek was thinking about a new play for the National Theater in Prague, he developed those workers into, quote, living and intelligent working machines. And when he wrecked brains, how to name them? First he, came to, first, he came up with labors or labors inspired by the English word labor. But he was not satisfied with it. And he shared his doubts with his brother. Karel Chapek himself later described it in these words. Name them robots, the painter muttered with a brush in his mouth and then continued to paint. And that was it. The word has Slavic root with the same meaning as labor, but with a strong stress on serfdom. Imagine that Karel Chapek would not doubt about how to name them, and the play got the name RUL, Rosum's Universal Labors or Labors. Are you sure labor or labor would become the same icon as robot is today? I don't think so. The magic of words and their sounds is a powerful, powerful sorcerer. But back from RUL to RUR, no one at home is a prophet. prophet. Contemporary criticism of the play was not always, always favorable, though praise significantly prevailed. In Czechoslovakia, in particular, the leftist cultural avant-garde rebuked Chapek for seizing a catchy topic why not bringing anything new? In fact, only a sophisticated kitsch, the purpose of which is just uh, the purpose of it, which is just to appeal to an international audience. Even if that probably was not the author's first plan, that was exactly what happened. R U R appealed to the audience wherever the play arrived. The drama was appreciated by A. G. Wells and the famous author. 
the A.G. Wells, and the famous author and one of the most influential public intellectuals of his time, later promoted Chapek's unsuccessful nomination for Nobel Prize for Literature. As I already mentioned, there were many interpretations of the metaphor in 1920s and 30s when it was staged all over the world. And in the new century, with the new development of science and international structure, more contemporary interpretation of Chapek's metaphor and figures have also been offered. Rossum's universal robots can be seen with today's, uh, today's eyes a global biotechnology corporation comparable in value, innovation, and influence to Google, Apple, Facebook, and Tesla combined. The key human heroine of the drama, Helena Glory, could be a predecessor of an activist of some current worldwide human rights NGO. According to some, Chapek liked this play, play the least of all his dramatic works. His reserved relationship with RUR is also evidenced by his answer in a newspaper interview. This play could, be, uh, could have been written by anyone. Just to remind one anecdote from the birthday of RUR. We celebrate on January 25, uh, when the world first night of the play was in the National Theater in Prague. But in fact, first night happened in unintentionally on January 2nd in provincial town of Hradec Králové. The non-professional actors did not respect the postponement of the show at the National Theatre. So the world premiere of RUR took place at the regional stage performed by amateur actors directed by the state railways inspectors. These are irony, ironies of the world. But back to the robot again, not only discoverers are important for the development of any field or topic, but also those who are constantly developing and adapting it. In case of robot, we may say that if Chapek was his genetic father, his adaptive father was Isaac Asimov. In fact, that was him who enriched the old theme of artificial being or living machines with Chapek's robot and edit then imaginary science of robotics. With not only legal, but also scientific in invention, he then de 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 defines three laws of robotics. Thanks to Asimov's laws, humans and robots can live together and co cooperate. That was absolutely fundamental step. The robot as an artificial being ceased to be only the threat to man, but became his partner, sometimes servant, sometimes protector. This is one of the reasons why Asimov's laws are still quoted, but also modified and extended to correspond with the world, which is not only fictitious, but real, and where robots are gradually moving. Already today, they are part of production halls, armaments, operating theaters, and kitchen units. Isaac Asimov always reminded of robots' Czech origin and Chapek's play not directly, directly in the stories of his robot, but he always did so in popular science works, which he wrote more than anyone else. Moreover, however, the play itself did not affect or interested him in any way. I heard it directly from him. Many, more than 30 years ago, I visited him in New York, and of course, he, I asked about. Asimov, Asimov said that he knew the play, but was not impressed by it. According to him, the, he, to him, the idea was good, but the play itself was not about what he considered essential and interesting on topics. Well, important, it's, it was about the, about the people. Both men were apart not only by one generation, but also by the cultural background and the perspective. In a way, they could serve as the models for C.P. Snow's great essay on two cultures and scientific revolution. Karel Chapek as Mr. Humanities and Isaac Asimov as Mr. Science. They speak about the same, but using different languages. I could end, uh, I could end up here by uh, just one last thing. Literary robots 
And it does not matter if they are androids made of artificial flesh and bone or machines made of metal, wires and chips are more and more mixed, even, conf uh, mox mixed, even confused or replaced with two letters, IA, artificial intelligence. Intangible and uncountable IA is the robot of tomorrow, it seems. Farid Zakaria say, says it quite nicely in his latest book, Ten Lessons for Post-Pandemic World, which is not about the distant future, but about the already coming one. The quote is from the fifth lesson named the digital, digital age, digital life, sorry. In fact, intelligent machines might, uh, uh, might make us prize our human companions even more for their creativity, whimsy, impredictability, warmth, and intimacy. This is not such a strange thought. For much of history, humans were praised for many qualities other than their power to calculate. Bravery, loyalty, generosity, faith, and love. So Zakaria says, and I say Chapek would agree with him. Thank you. Well, this is all. <laughs> Thank you so much. We appreciate Jaroslav Weiss and his contribution about Karl and Josef Czapek and the play RUR. The idea of using robots to help the human race is not exactly new. Robots are made, made the leap from science fiction to establish science a long time ago. We have seen them doing amazing tasks, such as exploring the terrains of Mars. Robotics is even used in physical therapy, where devices trapped on lip limbs can aid a patient's movement. Today, we will look at a new field called socially assisted robotics, where a robot can be a companion and a motivator. At the University of Southern California Center for Robotics and Embedded Systems, robots are being developed that will play one-on-one -on -one supporting roles with the elderly, patients recovering from strokes, even children with, with social disorders such as autism or attention deficit disorder. Machines from the few new field called socially assisted robotics operate not through physical contact or by performing some physical tasks, but through the social interaction. I would like to welcome our next distinguished guest, Professor Maya Matarik, who is uh, a distinguished professor of computer science, neuroscience and pediatrics also, she is interim vice president of research at the University of Southern California. She is also a founding director of the University of Southern California Robotics and Autonomous Systems Center. She's a co-director of the USC Robotics Research Lab and the lead of the Viter BK12 STEM Center. She received her PhD and MS in computer science and artificial intelligence from MIT and a Bachelor of Science in Computer Sciences from the University of Kansas. She is a recipient of the Presidential Award for Excellence in Science, Mathematics and Engineering Mentoring from President Obama Another uh, award is from Anita Borg Institute for Women of Vision Award for Innovation and many other awards. Professor Matarik published extensively. She is the author of a popular introductory robotics textbook, The Robotics Primer, published by MIT Press in 2007. I would like to welcome Professor Matarik and give her word to introduce you to her uh, science and what she is doing currently.
Okay, I just, hello everyone. Uh, nice to see everyone. Actually, I can't see anyone but my slides for now. Uh, can you set, can you see my slide? Just say something vocally. Yes. Excellent. Okay, let's get started. So I am indeed going to talk about a particular field under the very large and fast growing field of robotics and that is socially assistive robotics. But first, let's look at the big picture. So, um, as you heard from the introduction and from the talk right before me, you heard the roots of the word robot, which is indeed menial labor. And the field of robotics started by focusing on the three C's of robotics. Um, sorry, the three D's of robotics, dirty, dull, and dangerous. So machines were going to be created to replace people from the jobs that people didn't want to do. So things that were dangerous or dull or dirty. It could be an assembly, it could be nuclear plants, it could be in space, it could be under the ocean, etc. That's how it started. Uh, but that's not what we are today. So here we are in 2021. And because of the nexus of technologies that we are, that we have at our fingerprints today, uh, we can build robots that do anything we imagine. Now, they're not great at everything yet. But we have moved away from creating machines that are merely utilitarian to creating machines that we can just dream of. And that's interesting because that may not be entirely good. And so what I'm going to put forward is a very important uh, part of the future of robotics and its impact on humanity is the need for balance. So we are currently in the world focusing largely on automation. Automation is the replacement of people in the process of some kind of work, whatever it may be, um, in order to make that process more efficient, safer, and cheaper. That's very important and useful in some realms, but maybe isn't the best way to do everything, because then that does put the question of the future of work uh, foremost in our minds, and in particular issues of equity, economics, etc. And so what I would like to have people think about globally is the need for balance between automation and augmentation. Uh, the early images of robotics also thought about robotics as a way of enhancing human ability. So not replacing, but enhancing. Um, and that is really a spectrum of what the field of robotics should be about. Going from complete replacement in some realms, where it makes perfect sense, really, who wants to go into a nuclear plant and be around danger, all the way to enhancement, where we allow people to become better at something through the use of robots instead of replacing them. And that's really what I'm going to focus on today. I'm going to focus on ways in which robotics can augment human ability and a particular subset of that through social interaction. So we as humans need to have a purpose in order to thrive. And all studies show that our sense of purpose comes from doing some kind of work. That work doesn't have to be physical, right? You don't have to go out and dig a ditch to feel like you have a purpose in life but you do need to have something to do. And so that's very important because as we think about AI and robotics, we have to think about what is the human sense of purpose going to be in the future? Um, and it, we already know also that people who lose a sense of purpose uh, have very bad health outcomes from mental health to physical health to longevity. And so we need to think about our technologies, not just robotics, but many, many other digital technologies and how they may take work away and discourage socialization, which is the other thing that makes us live longer. That is social connections. And this pandemic has shown um, how negatively uh, we are impacted when we can't in fact have some kind of social connection. So it's not all doom and gloom, but it is important to keep in mind that as we have this massive challenge of human health and wellness, it is also a massive opportunity. Um, so we have, and when I originally started in this field, we were looking at regaining function and retaining independence for the elderly, which is of course a huge and growing population, although unfortunately diminished by the pandemic. Um, but then it goes really across the age and ability spectrum. So there's a very large rise in childhood developmental delays um, and there's a, and you know, including autism and others. Um, and then across the age span, we have a massive growth in anxiety, isolation, and depression, certainly across the developed countries and likely beyond. So we have a, a worldwide challenge, not, not just in the pandemic, but across the board. Um, and certainly the pandemic is a thing we didn't plan for, maybe we should have, 
but here we are. Um, and so we see both wonderful uses of technology, doing many things remotely, but also the unintended consequences of those, such as isolation, loneliness, and depression, and also inequity. So I want to tell you about one branch of robotics that has ways of helping with that. Not, of course, solving the entire problem, because the roots of these societal problems are deeper and wider. However, it is a type of technology that, instead of replacing work, in fact, empowers people to continue to do work and have a sense of purpose. And that is this idea of socially assistive robotics, which has now been around for about 16, 17 years. So we're going to come up to a 20 year anniversary soon. And the idea is that the machine provides a motivation and social companionship in order to give people the drive to help themselves, the drive to do their own work, not doing their work for them, but helping them be able to do work so that they can remain productive and have that sense of purpose and also often have a job. So let's talk a little bit about, first of all, why we're talking about robots. So you could say, well, why don't you have an app that, on your phone or a watch that buzzes and reminds you of what you should be doing? Well, it turns out that doesn't really work in terms of behavior change. It's not about knowing what you need to do. It's having the grit, the stamina, the perseverance to push through the hardship. And for that, having a physical um, entity makes a lot of difference. So here are some images of brain scans in functional MRI. This is work from Caltech, um, not from our lab, um, that shows basically that there's a certain involvement of your brain when you are watching videos on the screen and images on the screen. And certainly your brain is very engaged. However, when you're interacting with the very same thing that you might that you saw on the screen but now you're interacting with it in the physical world much more of your brain is engaged what that means simply is that there's more activation and there are higher levels of activation and then of course if there's tactile interaction then there's even more why because this is how we're wired we're wired to be social creatures that interact in the physical world so when you interact with the robot in the context of learning or training or recovery you can learn, train, and recover faster and with more enjoyment than when you're doing that with a screen. So, however, this is not easy because creating machines that can actually be around us and behave in ways that we find enjoyable and effective is non-trivial. It's a lot easier, in fact, to create machines that will be in cages far away from people. In some ways, it's easier to create a robot for a nuclear plant that it is to create a robot that will go into your home. Uh, in fact, history has shown that. We do have robots in nuclear plants. We don't really have robots doing something truly useful and safe in the homes yet because it's harder. So the robot has to learn everything from scratch to be around people. I just wanna show this one fun video because dancing robots are something that we need much more of clearly. So just how does the robot even move smoothly around people necessarily to disco because that's the best stuff. All right, so we have spent the last nearly 20 years, as I said, developing socially assistive robots uh, for various contexts. And we have looked in particular into health and wellness. So we have deployed quite a few long-term real world studies, and this is critical. So there's a lot of robotics research that happens in the lab. Um, and that is problematic because if everything you do is in the lab, it may never work in the real world. So you have to try it in the real world. It's very hard to try things in the real world, but it's necessary. It's necessary for relevance and progress. And so we've gone into rehab centers, cardiac disease boards, autism clinics, special education schools and classrooms, uh, nursing homes, retirement homes, um, just all over the place, thanks to the incredible stamina and grit and, and dedication and compassion of my students at USC. This is, you know, generations of students going out there doing the hard stuff outside of the lab in the real world. Um, and this is what we've learned. For example, we did a study recently where we left especially designed robots in the homes of children with autism in Los Angeles in the not very wealthy neighborhoods to see how they could support their learning process. This is a video this was supported by the National Science Foundation, and this is a video that's found on the web. So I'll just I'll just play a few, you know, a couple of bits of it, but you can see it in its completion on the web if you're interested. Meet Adrian, age six. This is some great work. And his robot friend, Q. 
Kiwi. You are doing an amazing job. On this weekend morning, they've settled in to play some games, along with big brother Darren. Adrian is on the autism spectrum, and Kiwi is no toy. It's a socially assistive robot. You are doing really great. So, just the thing that I want to point out here is we can now create machines that can be supporting buddies for children with special needs in a variety of settings, whether it's in the home, which is the hardest, or in a therapy center, or in a special needs classroom, or even in a regular classroom, uh, wherever they can help the teacher, the parent. I mean, again, um, the pandemic showed that the need to create support structures in the home so that one parent doesn't spend all of her or his time just tending to the child, which makes them burned out and depressed as well. Um, so here is this opportunity to deploy machines that will actually help children as they learn. So the example here, which again, you can see more on the web, is that what, what the student is learning is math, but also social skills, because that's what happens in school. You learn to be around other people and behave socially appropriately around other people. But what is if, what happens when you can't be around other people because it's the pandemic or because a, there's atypical behavior and other kids shun kids with autism, which is very sad and results in less practice of social skills. And so this is where the machine becomes a learning partner and often attracts other children so that now Adrian can have more friends because they also want to come and play with Adrian and the robot. So that's just one vision of how we augment human learning of social skill and cognitive skills through a robot. Another area that we're working on is work with very young infants. So when you look at infant development, you find that there are, there are developmental delays that happen and they're hard to detect early on. But if you detect them early on, you can help through interventions and therapies. But even then it's very hard because it's hard to have enough therapists for all children who have developmental delays. And it's a lot, it's one in six children in the US will experience a developmental delay. And that's the diagnosed. So again, when we quote diagnosed numbers, we know that there are many more who are undiagnosed. So here's an example of using a robot that is the size of a baby. It doesn't have the shape of a baby, unfortunately. It's not as cute, um, but it's the size of a baby. And that's why it's able to interact with the baby. And it, it, it stimulates the baby to move and exercise its limbs. And that helps us determine if the baby is developing typically or atypically and whether the baby then needs more exercise, which the robot can help with, um, in a way that actually helps the parents because the parents are a little too big for the baby to relate to in the same way. So the robot feels a need to complement what the parent or the therapist can do. So the robot shows something to the baby and babies are very smart. They learn very quickly. And so now the baby's gonna learn within two minutes what he needs to do, um, or certainly under five minutes. So this is interesting because it's not, it's not the robot learning from the baby. It's the baby learning from the robot. Why? Because the baby is very interested because the robot looks very interesting and similar to the baby. A little different than a parent. And a lot of fun too. And so you can deploy these kinds of machines to help babies exercise all day long. Something again, that is unaffordable with human care. So you want to have a professional therapist and the parents helping the baby as much as possible. But the rest of the time, technology needs to step in and it has to be effective. And this turns out to have high promise. So what we're really interested in doing is creating machines that can personalize to each user, whether that user is an Alzheimer's patient in a nursing home who doesn't get very many human visitors, unfortunately, or can't get any human visitors during a pandemic, whether that patient is a stroke survivor who needs to exercise their stroke affected limb literally six to 10 hours a day, but they can't because it's very depressing and demoralizing and no one is there before them 10 hours a day, or whether it's a young child who really needs to be assessed and helped in their own specific way as they're developing and changing. And for that to happen, we need a lot of interactions in real world settings and we need a lot of data because every user is different and every user changes. And there's this really interesting dynamic of interaction that happens when people interact and when, when machines interact with people. And it's constantly evolving and changing. And so we're just developing methods in machine learning to do that. So don't believe anyone who tells you, oh, we already know how to do this with machine learning. We do not. Um, AI is very, very far from having any common sense 
having the ability to generalize from one area to another. But there's a lot of potential for doing great good. But for that to happen, we need to have long-term data sets from the home, from the therapy center, from the hospital, from schools. And they need to be in interesting and rich interactions. So not just, you know, a lot of pictures of people on Google, not enough. Here is an interesting interaction of a child with special needs and a robot. And look how beautifully smooth it works. And why don't we see this? I don't, I don't know of any company that is developing this. One. One. Two. Two. So the robot Eight. knows if the child is getting it right, Three. if the child is making eye contact, if One. the child is moving, and it's rewarding Four. just in order, just at the right time. Five. And the robot is completely autonomous. There is no Five. wizard behind the, cu the curtain controlling the robot. Six. So we can do this today. Excellent. And yet you cannot go into a store and buy this robot. And why is that? It's because companies are not choosing to do this kind of work. They're not choosing to develop technologies that actually help to enhance human ability, especially when, they're, when the human ability is affected, whether it's special needs or post some kind of trauma. Um, we don't see these technologies being developed and sold. Why is that? That's bad. So. There's a lot, a lot of evidence um, in rehabilitation, dementia care, Alzheimer's disease, and also healthy aging, that as people age and feel isolated and demoralized, we need someone that really cares. And people who do not have another human who is there all the time find great joy and support and can live longer through the help of technology such as these kinds of robots. Uh, again, I already mentioned autism, but this goes broader. So from developmental disorders to mental health more generally, um, in the US, 40% of college students uh, have depression or anxiety diagnosed. College students, these are students who should be at the height of joy of their lives, right? So there, there's a need for technologies that can be personalized, that can help people. And we already have evidence that we can develop this. And we're not talking about robots taking place of other people. We're talking about robots helping people when no other people are around or robots helping to bring children together, to bring people together so that they can help one another. So we know this works. There's a lot of evidence. Uh, there's evidence from autism with kids smiling for the first time when they're interacting with the robot, uh, talking more, taking turns, initiating play. There's evidence with the elderly, decreasing stress levels, talking more to others, in enjoyment, um, delay of onset of various decline. Um, and there's evidence from learning, great evidence to show that people can learn faster and more and enjoy the learning process more through the support of these socially assistive machines. Um, so we know it works, but we don't see enough of it in the real world. So I would say, get some companies to develop more of this because we need it. Um, because we really do need these machines that empower um, and help to give us purpose. And perhaps more so than some other kinds of machines that are being routinely developed for more kind of entertaining purposes than this that could really make a difference. Um, and I just want to close to put it in a, in a kind of larger context, which is that these larger real world problems that we're facing across the world, um, they're real opportunities. You can look at these problems and say, oh, they're huge, they're depressing, what can I do? But in fact, in robotics in particular, we can address every single one of these. And some people are, but not enough. And so my charge to people is to choose to work on meaningful real world problems, whether it's in robotics or not, but certainly within the larger field of AI, artificial intelligence, machine learning, there's so much we can do. So we should do it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mataric. Uh, it was quite interesting to see how the robotics change. And when I saw your uh, uh, speech, uh, I thought, in fact, that Karel Čapek created the robots which looked alike like people, but behaved like the metallic monsters. And when I look on the first Isaac Asimov robotic story, Robbie, in fact, this is where the metallic monster was behaving like a man, being a friend, the best friend of the boy. That means maybe this was also one of the things Isaac Asimov predicted.
But uh, before uh, introducing a, a special guest, I will speak a bit more about uh, robots and Chapek. Uh, as I mentioned, what is robot with Chapek? He thought it as a living machine in biological sense, like a creature, a bit more closer to Frankenstein than what the robots which were made by Isaac Asimov. But he was really unhappy. As uh, Yaroslav Weiss mentioned, um, Karel Čapek didn't like his play. He thought that it was the worst play of his. And he also disliked very much how the robot was developing. But it was not mentioned that in 1935, he has published a short article on Czech Daily Lidové Noviny. I have no idea if this was translated into English or not, which is titled, author of robots fights back. And he tried to explain the people that he really wanted the robots to be in a way people, not a machines, but he lost the fight. From the very beginning, when the drama started going on stages, his people robots were becoming monster metallic robots. I want to say a few words about it. Uh, when we look on the early dramatizations, very often uh, they became, the robots became the monsters made from sheet metal. But when you look on 1921, on the first dramatization, we do have only two photos from the dramatization of the robots. And we see the robots have something like a standard uniform of a worker. And the only thing you can think that it's a robot, they had a number, a number on the uniform. When the first German dramatization in 1923 in Berlin happened, uh, it was made by Frederick Kiesler, future to be famous, uh, famous uh, drama producer. And he made it the first in a futuristic avant-garde style with a film projection instead of the backdrop. Also this moved the robot somewhere to the future, somewhere unrealistic. But once more, Karel Čapek wanted to have a play about people, not about machines. But even worse for Karel Čapek's idea was when robot R.E.R. came to Anglo-Saxon world. 1922 New York production was first made after the translation of Paul Silver. Whenever I speak about it, I say, usually you have a Paul Silver translation, but they are definitely better translation than Silver. It's Peter Heim's translation, or the books which were published recently by Cat Barrett Press in the United States. These translations are better. But still, Paul Server translation made the style. It really became a norm. And what Paul Server did, he removed a very short few sentences in the book where he, intro uh, he removed introductory text of Chapek about the appearance of a robot. Jaroslav Weiss mentioned it. He wanted something like a uniform, nothing else. But when Silver removed it, it gave a freedom to American and British producers to make it different. Silver also added a new subtitle, a fantastic melodrama. Once more, something I can imagine Karel Čapek disliked or didn't like, or maybe he even told it, but I haven't seen that. And while Europe dramatizations were more about avant-garde, the American and British were more realistic. It was a really action drama, action packed with adventure about the evil robots which are destroying the humanity. When we look on the 1923 London performance, it was even worse for, for Karel Čapek. Photos and reviews show Robots in metallic costumes resembling medieval armor. And even there is a beautiful painting, beautiful sketch of one of the journalists showing impressions, his impressions from RUR. Robots twice bigger than men, than humans, and the title, Fall of Mankind. Karel Čapek's creature recreated itself in something totally different. And maybe that's also the reason why uh, there was no really response by many people in the Czech Republic on RUR because they see that dichotomy. And also the fact that there is no film based on RUR. 
In fact, there is only one Czech film, which is really having a robot in the heart of the film. And as the Czechs are not, Czechs are really people who like making jokes of everything. Sometimes I say Czechs are not very serious people. And this film is not a very serious film. It is a very bad film. It is as bad that it could have a cult follow-up, but I don't think it was ever shown in the United States. Its title is Babičky dobijte přesně, or you should charge your grannies properly, because it's about the grannies, about the grannies helping the people, something like Dr. Mataric spoke, but with, of course, that Czech Swift. And we will show you a very short, a short part of the film showing what can happen when the Czech creators take over Chapek's robot and make a film of it. We should be happy that Karel Chapek has never seen this film because he will definitely hate it even more than the London or New York dramatizations. It is really something where the robot developed into a totally different world Karel Chapek had not thought about. But what is also interesting, world well, literature do have a sequels. Nobody really did a sequel of Are You Are, except very recently in the anthology we edited last year, Robot 100, a short drama by famous Czech science fiction writer Andrzej Neff made a very short dramatical sequel to Are You Are, which also shows the dichotomy of what kind of robots are. In the world, the mechanical robots which are coming from the land, visiting the island where the original robots live, find that it's not going the right way and they slaughter the original robot. And the new robots which came are definitely those monsters from the metal sheet. This is how Andre Neff fights the end of that conflict between metallic monsters and, uh, and uh, the living creatures. But as I said, uh, it's very pity that robot is not so used in the Czech literature, not so used in Czech drama. Uh, I have supported the uh, Filipino translation and dramatization in the Philippines, and there will be another dramatization soon. And I'm really happy that I can introduce next guest of ours, who surprised me with the fact that he's preparing the local dramatization named R.U.R. 2020. I am really awaiting what the dramatization will be. And please, I will give the floor to Cole Remen, who is from University of California at Santa Barbara, who will have the dramatization hopefully later this year. And this is not his first play, not the first play connected with science fiction, because he's also well known for the Star Trek musical, most probably the first Star Trek musical ever made, which he did a few years ago. Please, Cole. Uh, well, thank you for having me. I'm, I'm very pleased to be here and, and to tell you a little bit about my uh, upcoming adaptation of uh, Carol Chopik's Rossum's Universal Robots. Um, so uh, as Mr. Weiss said earlier, uh, Carol Chopik's original play premiered in 1921. Um, and when I first read it, I found it extremely evocative and timely. Uh, so much of what it discusses is relevant still today. Um, it has been said that almost every work about robots is in some way derivative of RUR. Um, and that's probably not much of an overstatement. Uh, Chopek in his play is imagining this new being that is both a twin and an opposite of humanity. So it's, it's a mirror in both senses of the word. He's thinking ahead to the utopian potential of automation, but also the potentially detrimental effects it could have on labor markets. Uh, he's imagining the uncanny effect of that which is not strictly human looking and behaving convincingly human. He's also theorizing the post-human and he plots the first robot revolution. So there's all of these things that we think of as sort of common tropes of science fiction today that really have their, their, their home in, in RUR. So this prescient work really didn't just coin the word robot, but it, robot, but it shaped the being's narrative scope and trajectory. It's, it's anticipating anxieties of automated labor and, and living machines 
you know, uh, that are more pressing today than ever before. Um, however, Chopic's play, although it was wildly popular in its day, is, uh, as has been said before, uh, is sort of overlooked in the dramatic canon and it's rarely performed. Uh, certainly not performed as often as it ought to be, uh, to be properly recognized. Um, so I wanted to try to fix that. I wanted to try to re remedy that. Uh, so my new adaptation called RUR 2020 revitalizes this classic and foundational work of science fiction theater a full century later. It is one part faithful update of the classic, but also weaves in a new story that gives it a twist and puts the play into a new perspective. My play reimagines uh, Chopek's satire, which he called a comedy of science and of truth. Uh, as, as a drama, uh, actually a memory play from the perspective of the first robot that we meet in the original, uh, the character of Sulla. Uh, so in Chopik's play, Sulla is the assistant to the Rossum Corporation's manager, Harry Doman. She is uh, a quick-witted, intelligent, likable, and extremely capable robot character, but we don't really see what happens to her as this robot uprising grows throughout the rest of the play. Uh, so the initial inspiration for my adaptation and really the, the root of most of these more significant changes uh, stems from my attempts to address the questions, what is Sulla's story? Where does she end up after that first scene? So in considering uh, her story beyond that brief appearance in the opening scene, uh, as the play progresses in, in my new adaptation, we trace the plot of the original play now framed as a series of flashbacks. Uh, the progression of the robot revolution led by the fanatic robot Marius is brought about by unexpected issues in the development of enhanced nervous systems that allows the robot to experience pain. Uh, that's of course sort of the story of, uh, of the original. In my version, outside of these recollect recollections uh, years in the future, this new synthetic overlords are unable to create more robots and face imminent extinction. So uh, Sulla and Alquist, who's a former Rossum engineer and the sole surviving human, are attempting to use Sulla's memories of the relationship between Harry Doman and the robot rights activist, Helena Glory, to protect the future against the uh, seemingly inevitable self-destruction of the remaining intelligent life. Along the way, Sulla and Alquist make shocking discoveries about the nature of consciousness and emotion, uh, love, grief, and what it means to be human or robot. So this new perspective uh, addresses modern questions that have emerged as robots have begun to make the transition from fiction to reality. Uh, questions like, what is the nature of consciousness? What does it mean to be human when we create artificial beings that can potentially surpass our abilities? How do we understand empathy in a world where emotion can be simulated? My new play speaks to these current anxieties, weighing the utopian and dystopian potentials of this now emerging technology. Uh, the most significant changes to uh, the original uh, occur later in my play, which is roughly analogous to Acts 3 and 4 in, in RUR. Um, early in considering Sulla's character arc and her trajectory, I thought it'd be interesting to bring Sulla and Helena together again in the, uh, in the final scene following the fallout of the robot uprising as a way to explore their dynamic in a radically different scenario. Uh, how would Sulla have to have adapted to the new post-revolution status quo? How would Helena react to what Sulla had needed to become in this violent context? And how might Sulla's duties to the robot's cause put her in conflict with the human who was the closest to what Sulla had as a friend? This led to some really interesting developments that enhance the dimensionality of these characters and, and their dynamic, this dynamic between the robot character and the human character uh, ultimately served as the emotional heart uh, of, my, of my play. Uh, throughout the writing process, I also strove to really find what I thought worked really well in the original and sort of emphasize that. So I strove to expand upon the symbolism of the original. Uh, in particular, I identified the motifs of music and nature uh, that I developed in Unified. The motif of music really became central uh, to the theme of emotion being tied uh, to expressions of creativity. So, uh, for example, Helena's piano playing in my version is placed in contrast to the robot's lack of creative inspiration, and that sort of serves as, as a new powerful metaphor. Likewise, there are references in Chopek's work to nature. Helena claims that she feels, quote, lost among huge trees, and she has a flower that's named after her. 
um, I took this language and brought these symbols together in Sula's new final monologue, uh, which further adapts Alquist's original monologue that references a world, quote, falling like leaves. So I'm heightening this, uh, this nature metaphor and the implication for new life by also showing Sulla caring for the flower with Helena's namesake, just as she ultimately will for the experimental robot that bears Helena's name. Overall, uh, my play RUR 2020 uh, celebrates the prescience, the, the prescience and uh, advent, inventiveness of the original RUR, uh, but it also updates the classic for a modern audience now a century after its publication. At the same time, my play goes beyond mere modernization. It's reimagining the classic from a new perspective with this new robot protagonist in order to pose contemporary questions concerning our relationship with the machines that are no longer mere speculation. Um, so uh, as uh, Mr. Osha said, I'm hoping to stage a production of my play at UC Santa Barbara in the fall of this year or early 2022, depending on the uh, restrictions on live performance during the pandemic. Um, so if you're interested, uh, you can be on the lookout for more information on that coming uh, sometime later this year. Thank you, Cole. Thank you very much for that. Uh, we are really awaiting it and we hope uh, it will be a big success. But um, I have to introduce our last speaker today. Um, because as I said, there were no, uh, no uh, sequels to RUR, but only a few writers also use the topics from RUR. And uh, one of these is Alvaro Zinas Amaro, uh, who uh, wrote at least two of his stories uh, featuring Rossums, a special type of robots he will speak about. Alvaro is a Hugo and Locus Award nominee. He has published more than 40 stories in all the important science fiction magazines uh, like Clark's World, NLO, Lightspeed, but also the magazine Nature, where one of the Rossum's stories have been published. And he published many, uh, he uh, contributed to many anthologies. And I, I will mention, of course, the year's best science fiction and fantasy, which is something a dream of every science fiction writer to be selected there. But if I am a writer and I am not, I would love to be featured in an anthology with a great name, the Mammoth Book of Jack the Ripper stories, or also in the anthology, it came from the multiplex. These are the great titles and I am sure his stories are great as well. But uh, please allow me to give floor to Alvaro. Thank you. Thank you so much for that uh, lovely introduction, and it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the influence of RUR and also examples in early science fiction as well as more contemporary science fiction of the robot in general. And a little bit, uh, I'm going to speak about the theme of the robot and the icon of the robot. So I'm going to start with just a few words on uh, the timeline uh, to give us a little bit of context. Our um, story tra storytelling traditions have um, always been very fascinated with the idea of artificial life and automatons or robot-like creatures. For example, all the way back to the Iliad, we have the character of Hephaestus, who is the divine smith. He creates a bronze giant named Talos to guard the island of Crete. We also famously have the legend of the golem in which a being is animated into life from mud or from clay. Um, jumping forward to the 18th century, this fascination with uh, replicating uh, uh, live beings was particularly manifested in the creation of uh, intricate um, robot type automata that relied on clockwork mechanisms. Uh, some have described this as the golden age of automata. And two uh, primary examples are Jacques de Vaucanson's mechanical duck. It was a piece named the digesting duck from 1738 and then Pierre Jacquardot's Boy Scribe, a writer from 1774. As has been mentioned a couple of times throughout our presentations, RUR itself was first performed in 1921. And 20 years later, Isaac Asimov actually coined the word robotics. Um, Asimov describes RUR as essentially being the same story as Frankenstein, but on a more grandiose scale, which is part of the reason that he didn't particularly care for it. Looking to uh, ahead to the depiction in, in popular culture, we had uh, Robbie the Robot in Forbidden Planet from 1956. 
And then also the housemaid uh, robot Rosie in the Jetsons from 1962 to 1967. So you can see how the image of the robot starts to permeate uh, popular culture. Interestingly, between those two events, the word cyborg was actually coined in 1960 by Manfred Klein's and Nathan S. Klein. And as I talk about some of these additional examples, the lines between robot, um, automaton, cyborg, android, and AI start to become very blurry. Um, for me personally, when I think about the history of robots depicted in uh, popular mediums such as television or film, uh, two events that I'd call out is the character of the robot in 1965 in Lost in Space, which was on from 1965 to 1968, and then very famously the AI uh, HAL 9000 in um, Stanley Kubrick's 1968-2001 Space Odyssey. Uh, and I mentioned these two because I think that after this point, around 68 or 69, the robots that we start to get in science fiction, um, particularly in, in cinema and uh, other popular media, are what I tend to think of as post-robot robots. They're robots that are created with specific quirks or sort of twists to them because they're very much consciously in conversation with all of the robots that had already become uh, popular at that time. So famously, we have R2-D2 and C-3PO in Star Wars 1977, Terminator, Robocop, so on and so forth. All of these provide their own visions, but as I mentioned, they're in dialogue with their predecessors. Um, specifically, uh, regarding the, the play that we've been talking about here today, Chapek's great work, uh, I want to reference a paper by uh, Camilla Kenyon, which is called The Phenomenology of Robots, Confrontations with Death in um, Carol Chapek's RUR, in which uh, the point is made that Chapek was actually a philosopher before becoming a fiction writer. And so Camilla Kenyon argues that RUR is actually an implicit criticism of two different ideas. One is Hegel's master-slave dialectic, and then the other one is Kant's categorical imperative. And, uh, and just as a quick example, the robot Damon, for, um, for instance, is mostly bound by a strict Kantian absolute of ethics throughout the play, but achieves a kind of indi individuality at the moment of death. Um, regarding the title, we've also had some comments on the etymology of those words. Uh, Rossum's Universal Robots um, some have pointed out that it would more accurately be translated as Rossum's artificial robots, but then you lose the, the symmetry of the U uh, translated from the original. Um, looking at the meaning of the words, Rossum can be associated with the terms intellect or reason. As we've seen, the word robot itself can be associated with the words forced labor or drudgery. And so in this sense, if you just translate those words from the title directly, you get the forced laborer or the drudgery of um, intellect or reason by artificial means. And uh, again, that makes it very clear, this idea of the master-slave dichotomy, but it also offers us the reading of the title as a mind-body duality. And uh, a little curious uh, footnote, the original title for Isaac Asimov's first uh, and famous short story robot collection, I, Robot, was actually Mind and Iron. And so I think purely accidentally, mind and iron nicely echoes that image of mind and body uh, that you can trace directly from the, the title of RUR. Adam Roberts, a well-known science fiction writer and scholar in his history of science fiction, he positions Chapek as really being outside of the number uh, of important high modernists uh, writers at that time who really had very explicit anti-machine views. And the thing that he praises about RUR's uh, work is how it wrestles with theological anxieties. I thought that that was a very interesting angle. Um, for example, Alquist, the character famously renames the modified robots who are presumably going to be able to reproduce at the end of the play. He calls them Adam and Eve, making that theological connection explicit. Um, this reading also helps to establish a continuity with Chapek's uh, two other works, The Factory of the Absolute, from 1922 and the war with the newts from 1936, which make use of their own um, theological images and uh, connotations. Uh, one line from the play that I actually want to quote is the character Damon, who at one point says, to be like people, it is necessary to kill and to dominate. And this shows up in a lot of uh, subsequent science fiction. Uh, with that in mind, some um, early examples, two that actually precede uh, the play, but don't use the word robot. 
Uh, one is the novel, The Aurora Phone from 1890, written by Cyrus Cole. This is a very interesting novel that features a race of Saturnians who create robots that are manufactured to do the dirty work, as we heard in the, uh, in the other presentation, and to fight wars. And in this text, they're referred to as dummies. So again, the word robot is not used, but it's a very similar concept. Um, also, George Haven Putnam, the famous publisher, he himself published a novel in 1894 titled The Artificial Mother, A Marital Fantasy. And in this book, you have a robot child carer, uh, again, uh, relevant based on the, the talk that we had, who ends up entering into a conflict with the biological mother of the, uh, of the story's twins. Um, in terms of the history of science fiction and early science fiction uh, before the 1920s, uh, we had characters who appeared as mechanical butlers, steam judges, and steam servants. Those were the earliest sort of things that approximated the, the more modern idea of the robot. And then in what is often called the Gernsback era from 1926 through 1936, uh, there is a lot of different ways in which the robot motif showed up in um, science fiction. We had robots as actors, robots as domestic help, uh, exploration devices, football players, general workers, robots in the military, robots in the police, spaceship stewards, uh, robots who were used to commit crimes. There was the revolt of the machines. There were cities that were run by machines, what we would probably call today smart cities. There was the evolution of machines. There was intelligence uh, and machine intelligence that ended up controlling the world. There were mechanical brains and supercomputers. There were machines that were used to predict the future. There was also at least one story of love between a machine and a human. And there were also future machines that believed that they evolved from humans via cyborgs and machines that they believed, uh, machines that believed that they created human beings and uh, as well as self-reproducing swarms of machine intelligence. So as you can see from that list, there was a huge array of different ways in which the, the, character, the, the icon of the robot was treated in popular fiction, uh, and that's just in the 1920s and 1930s. And so that brings me to um, some of the ideas on the thematic of the robot. Asimov described two main takes on this. He called them the robots as pathos and robots as menace themes, um, which is an interesting classification, but I want to go a little bit deeper than that. The, the critic and the um, reviewer, Gary K. Wolf, in his excellent book, The Known and the Unknown, The Iconography of Science Fiction, he has a whole chapter on the icon of the robot. And uh, Wolf essentially says, yes, a lot of the fiction that we've had presents the theme of the robot as an example of a rebellious machine. And a lot of it, he identifies, can be reduced to this sort of basic idea or nar narrative form. You have a series of transformations that take what starts out to be a tool and turns it into something much more than a tool. In some cases, something that transcends humanity and becomes godlike. And so in, um, writers who work on stories that have to do with robots really need to resolve that series of transformations um, to reconcile it with the idea of a mechanistic universe in which human dominion uh, is still possible. And so Wolf argues that there's really three resolutions to this, uh, to this problem. One is that any apparent threat to humans from robots just results from the fact that they're one more form of technology that's being misused. So he calls this the misused tool category of robot stories. And Asimov, as we've talked about, was a prime um, example of that. The second possible resolution is that the laws of mind and psychology and the laws of the physical universe are not disparate, that there's a fundamental connection there. And that was uh, a, an idea that was very uh, heavily explored by Jack Williamson in his works such as uh, With Folded Hands and um, The Humanoids. And this is what Wolf calls the human imperative. And then finally, the third most intriguing way to resolve this is the idea that if machines end up replacing humans, it may be so that they can ultimately recreate humans. And this is sort of the eschatological interpretation that Wolf offers. Uh, one, again, line that I'd like to quote from his piece is the following. The robot is a servant in conquering unknown worlds, but it is as much an unknown world in itself. I think that's a very nice summation of uh, some of those concepts. Um, in terms of the theme of the robot, I actually have my own sort of slight, uh, slightly different reading. And again, it's inspired by something that I came up with that, that I found uh, in Adam Roberts' History of Science Fiction. 
there's a chapter in which Adam Roberts is discussing uh, Aldous Huxley's novel from 1928, Point Counterpoint. And in this book, there's a character named Mark Rampion, who is apparently based on D.H. Lawrence. And this character complains about how the new generation, the youth of today, are just very enamored and obsessed with mechanization. And they're sort of like idiot-like in their behavior because they're, they're so obsessed with the new technologies. And if you think back to the rate of technological progress, it really began to grow very dramatically and markedly in the early 1920s. It, it, may, it would make sense that a new generation would demonstrate more ease with and fascination by uh, mechanization and machinery. So my, in my view, I think one possible way to interpret the robot is to say that it, the robot can act as a metaphor for intergenerational alienation or angst. And if you go with that reading, you can take a famous story, like for example, Isaac Asimov's The Last Question, and you can kind of reconfigure it into a tale about how our own built-in mortality and obsolescence may ultimately provide a kind of cyclical uh, redemption and renewal. Um, finally on this, I want to also quote from a much more recent book, the anthology edited by Neil Clark called More Human Than Human, which is again, all about robots, cyborgs, and AIs. In the introduction, Neil Clark says the following, the Android sits front and center as a shining example of our best hopes and deepest fears. Androids are, after all, humanity's children made in its own image. Again, I think that this can be tied into the idea of a kind of generational passing of the torch. Uh, I just wanna finish with some recent examples or more recent examples of the robot in science fiction, both in printed and in um, other media. Uh, in print, there was actually a, a, a trilogy of novels called the I, Robot Trilogy, which was written by Mickey Zucker Reichert, authorized by the Asimov estate. And it's in fact a prequel trilogy that explores Susan Calvin's work before the iRobot stories. Those are three books published between 2011 and 2016, To Protect, To Obey, To Preserve. Um, looking at short fiction over the last 12 to 15 years, a lot of top stories have had robots as their protagonists or lead characters. I'll name just a few. Uh, Elizabeth Bear's short story Tideline uh, features a robot protagonist. That short story won the Hugo for Best Short Story in 2008. The very next year, 2009, Ted Chang's short story Exhalation also won the Hugo for Best Short Story. And there, that story is all about uh, air-driven mechanical beings. Fast forward to 2016, Naomi Kritzer's story Cat Pictures, Please, features an AI as a central character. That story, again, won the Hugo for uh, Best Short Story. Uh, one other um, series that I want to um, talk about very briefly is Martha Wells' Murderbot series. So far, there have been five installments in this series. Uh, it started in 2017. And the most recent uh, of these stories is a novel that was published last year titled Network Effect. Uh, two of the novellas in the series have already won, again, the Hugo for best novella, and the character is the murder bot of the title. Um, two other recent stories, Ray Naylor's father from the July-August issue of Asimov Science Fiction Magazine, uh, July-August 2020, and then Michael Swanwick's story, Artificial People, from the July 2020 issue of Clark's World. These are also, I think, very good stories that feature um, robots as central characters. As was mentioned earlier, um, I have had two stories published that include Rossums as characters, and one of them includes both Rossums and robots to kind of illustrate the differences in my interpretation of some of um, Chapek's work. Uh, briefly, in television and film, similar uh, recent examples, robots are essentially everywhere you look. Uh, in animation, for example, in 2008, we had the standout film Wally. Uh, in independent cinema, we had uh, Robot and Frank in 2012, handling the theme of AI, we had Her in 2013. 2014, we had Ex Machina. 2015, we had Chappie. Uh, in 2017, we had an excellent film that explored an ecosystem of different types of artificial intelligences, Blade Runner 2049. Um, more recently, in 2019, the main villain of the second season of Star Trek Discovery turned out to be an AI called Control. Uh, in 2019, we had the sixth film in the Terminator sequ uh, se sequence, Terminator Dark Fate. Uh, we also had Alita Battle Angel that featured many robots in 2019 on the big screen. Uh, again, in the Star Trek universe last year in 2020, we had the first season of Star Trek Picard 
in the entire plot of the first season of Star Trek Picard, Picard, mild spoiler alert, revolved around an ancient admonition that warned against synthetic life forms reaching a certain critical stage. And there's also a, a lead character in the series that ends up being um, sort of reincarnated into an artificial vessel, which really makes explicit that eschatological interpretation that I was mentioning by Gary Wolf earlier. Uh, a couple of other examples, season three of Westworld, obviously this show heavily revolves around artificial intelligence and robots. It's been renewed for a fourth season. Again, last year we had Tales from the Loop, which featured robots, and then also Ridley Scott's Raised by Wolves, which has also been renewed for a second season. Um, just to close out, I'd like to echo what Cole was saying earlier. RUR really embodied in prescient form aspirations and anxieties about artificial beings. And these continue to play out in today's narratives in just a dizzying array of expressions, as I hope the kind of brief survey that I provided uh, has shown. And I'm really excited to see uh, Cole's reinterpretation and add that uh, to that to that list. Um, I think that robots also offer a perfect literary device for literalizing our attitudes towards technology in general. And then also our perceptions of um, compartmentalization. As science fiction itself has become really fractured into multiple subgenres, for example, alternate history, cyberpunk, steampunk, dystopia, military science fiction, it's perhaps not surprising that robot, robots, cyborgs, androids, AIs uh, actually play a role in almost all of these different subgenres. And it's one of the few icons that is as versatile and can be adapted to all of them. Um, each generation of storytellers, I believe, stretching all the way from Chapix uh, uh, to today's, must grapple with its own particular vision of what robots mean. And the very act of doing so reinforces what those symbolic artificial beings represent, further deepening their weight and import in our collective consciousness. So that concludes the thoughts that I wanted to share. Thank you again for uh, having me on here. Very much appreciate it. Thank you very much, Alvaro, for your uh, for your information about the recent uh, recent science fiction robots. I have one small note. Uh, when you mentioned that Chapek was uh, very much untypically for those times anti-machine, uh, I would mention uh, Miles J. Brewer, whose early story about anti-machine uh, Paradise and Iron was published in uh, in pulps in the 1930s and late 20s. It was the first anti-machine in the US literature. And I will note that he was also Czech. Does this mean that the Czechs are anti-machine? Maybe we'll have to develop the discussion on that topic as well. Thank you very much for that. And now we have a couple of questions uh, to be answered if I can read some of them. Uh, the first question comes uh, from uh, San Francisco. Uh, will the Santa Barbara performance be video recorded? Could you answer please? Uh, yeah, we're, we're still sort of exploring uh, what those options are. Um, potentially, it could be it could be filmed. Um, I'm hoping that it's not over Zoom by the time that it that we actually produce it. So uh, I'm not sure if it's going to be as accessible, but it, it'll at least be live and not <laughs> mediated this way. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, there is a small note, not a question uh, that I should mention to uh, film cyber, cybernetic grandmother. It's a quite a unique film, also made by a Czech animator, Trnka. It's a typical puppet film, which has a robot as a main character. And the fact is that it was made in the early 1960s, made it most probably the first puppet film with a robot in it. And also have the same topic. The robot is helping as an artificial grandmother. That's only a small, small note. Uh, there is also another note, which I must say I have never heard about. Maybe some of the panelists have heard about it. There is no RUR film because Paramount bought rights by Chapek. Uh, the Paramount used to ask a huge sum of money and nobody could afford it. More is in the book by Shen Plugova Mushwagar Kareo Chapek. I will have to look on it. Do you have any idea about that? Answer must stay, uh, question must stay unanswered. I will have to look. And that's all the main questions we had for the moment. Any more questions? 
I would like to make a movie recommendation, completely not, not a question. Uh, Robot and Frank. Um, it's kind of a sleeper movie that many people haven't heard about because it was not a big, uh, well, big money production, like, for example, Blade Runner 2049, which was awesome, by the way. But nonetheless, uh, I recommend Robot and Frank. Excellent movie. I agree. Thanks. Thank you very much. Never heard about the movie. I see as a genre specialist, I have still some shortcomings. Thank you very much, Dr. Mataric. Oh, and then the other one that I also, sorry, I, now that, that we're on the topic, I realized I should have had a slide on this. The other one that I always recommend to everybody, and it only ends up being seen by kids, is WALL-E. WALL-E is a wonderful animated movie of kind of a reflection of humanity in machines, because of course, robots are just a reflection of humans. Um, and this arc of, you know, a better humanity. I just love that movie. So WALL-E. Fully agree with you. Any more questions, comments? Okay, in that case, I will have to thank all of you and have a small, short comments uh, at the end. Uh, we agree that uh, Josef and Karel Chapek created the word robot, uh, and it was Isaac Asimov who really made robot what is today. But a decade ago, I have asked the question, but who was the second person who used the word robot in science fiction or in literature? It means it's important when you create the word, that's fine, but people should follow it. And uh, most probably the earliest use of robot, and I would be pleased if somebody finds something earlier, is in a, a fairly forgotten novel by a French-born uh, UK writer, City of No Escape, published in 1925 by writer T.C. Bridges. And there is the first use of the word robot, most probably, but uh, I think there is a still a lot of things to be found. We are very proud of being a creators, the Czechs being a creators of robot. And I must say that the fact that we haven't uh, publicized the fact that it's a Czech word is a bit typical Czech, we are not proud of it. And I think one of the branding disasters of Czech was 15 years ago when the Japanese prime minister arrived to Prague, bringing one of the first early Japanese robots. And we, everybody was happy, except of one thing. His name was not Chapeku, as Chapek is named in Japan, but his name was Ashimo, after Asimo, Asimo. I think that says something. What Asimov knew very well. He is, in effect, father of robots. And we have a grandfather who is Karel Chapek. Thank you very much. I would like to thank everybody, all wonderful speakers, and everybody who contributed to organizing and creating this workshop and seminar, and also the additional wonderful distribution of this topic.